Hello, good afternoon um, and thank you for joining us. I'm Wendy Byrne, I'm the president of the college uh, and I'm chairing the event this afternoon. We've got 670 people um, signed up, so welcome. We're going to have presentations from three speakers and after that there'll be time for questions. You can use the question and answer panel on the side um, for our speakers. If you've got more general questions, please send them to our um, policy team and we'll put the link up um, for you. And please do tweet uh, throughout the um, event using the hashtag RCPsychLive. So I'll move on to um, our first speaker. Uh, unfortunately, our speaker, uh, Roger, couldn't be with us. He's in Hong Kong and he couldn't do it live because of the time difference. Um, so we've recorded a video which we're going to, um, to show you. He's a consultant psychiatrist with a special interest in psychotherapy, and he's the departmental head of the Department of Psychiatry in Kowloon Hospital in Hong Kong. He's currently president of the Hong Kong College of Psychiatrists and the Secretary of Education of the World Psychiatric Association. So over to Roger. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to Royal College of Psychiatrists of the UK of inviting me to give a webinar lecture on sharing the mental health work done in Hong Kong in combat against COVID-19 outbreaks. For your information, I'm the current president of Hong Kong College of Psychiatrists. However, I'm not representing my college or my employer to speak on this topic. The webinar is solely my personal review of the mental health work done in Hong Kong so far. Ever since the painful experience of SARS, in which over 200 people in Hong Kong died and many left with residual disabilities, Hong Kong has been highly vigilant about infectious outbreak in other parts of Asia. The painful experience of outbreaks in hospitals affecting many hospital staff and patients have only taught Hong Kong people that healthcare and residential institutions are key risk areas in need of stringent infection control. Besides, research and service data have informed us that after the epidemic died down, suicide and mental health service needs would increase substantially in the subsequent post-SARS years. When the news of clustering of pneumonia cases in Wuhan of China were known to the people in Hong Kong during Christmas time last year, most people followed the advice from infectious disease experts in Hong Kong on the following three principles. Number one, universal face masking. Number two, stringent hand hygiene. Number three, social distancing. Although these practices have indeed come as a major blow to food and entertainment industries in Hong Kong, as well as caused a public panic and scramble for amenities like face masks, hand rubbed and other daily amenities. These practices have become generally accepted as social etiquettes in Hong Kong. This has made it possible for healthcare facilities to adopt quick measures to control infectious outbreaks without much resistance from patients, carers and staff. By late January 2020, when Hong Kong started to have the first confirmed cases, the public health decision-making body convened an urgent meeting and issued a series of stringent measures to prevent infectious outbreaks in mental health facilities. We consider these measures as urgent as there is much evidence that patients in mental health institutions might be at risk of contracting and transmitting infections due to various reasons. Many of these measures have also been adopted based on the painful experience of massive outbreaks of COVID-19 infections in psychiatric wards in other parts of Asia. The overarching principle 
was to minimize human traffic within these facilities through number one, reducing emission, number two, enhancing discharge, and number three, exerting control of human flow, as well as stringent infection control within these facilities. Such principle applied to all types of mental health services. Only essential clinical services were maintained with staff and patients adhering to strict infection control measures, like screening of risk factors of COVID-19 infection and adequate personal protective equipment, social distancing during face-to-face -face consultation. As such, we were able to cut down outpatient attendances in the clinics by around 30 to 60 percent and also community outreach visits by 20 to 50 percent. Those patients with non-urgent clinical needs would be provided with drug reviewed arrangement supplemented by consultation and interventions using telephone or video conferencing means. All screened inpatients within wards were also cohorted into different groups according to the time periods of their missions, with an aim to contain outbreaks within specified groups and for easy contact tracing in case of having admitted an unknown infected patient into a ward. Patients were not allowed it to have temporary leave from wards or visits by friends or relatives. Televisits were, however, facilitated as far as possible. Staff with mental health services also had to adhere to strict infection control measures, including self-monitoring of body temperature and COVID-related symptoms social distancing between staff and especially during meal and tea times, and also self-imposed at home quarantine with pre-duty COVID-19 tests after recent overseas travel trips made by himself or herself or their close contacts. With these stringent measures, Hong Kong has been successful to prevent infectious outbreaks in mental health facilities, even since the first reported confirmed cases in Hong Kong on 22nd of January to 2020. Some overseas experts have commented that the measures implemented in Hong Kong might have been too stringent and not consistent with principles of autonomy and respect. While I fully respect these important ethical care principles, I must admit that I would rather apply this flexibly according to the context. I personally view that COVID-19 outbreaks are synonymous to a global warfare with an external enemy. During wartime, I feel that we have to sacrifice some of our personal freedom and autonomy for the good of the community and the general public. I believe that everyone's small effort of universal face masking, straight hand hygiene and social distancing do contribute to the overall success in the control of infectious outbreaks in Hong Kong. Patients and staff of mental health care are of no exception. This idea of self-sacrifice of oneself for the good of others may be more acceptable to the Asian communities where we value collective good and assume personal responsibilities of others' welfare and well-being. During this difficult period of partial lockdown in Hong Kong, Mental health services have relied more on the use of internet and smartphone technology to keep connected with our patients. Community outreach work for patients at home and in institutions is maintained at using telephone-based or Zoom-based facilities. 
Individual interventions for patients in need of continuing care are provided likewise. Given the impact of social unrest that happened in Hong Kong since June last year, various studies have estimated that around 20 to 30 percent of people were suffering from depressive and post-traumatic stress symptoms of clinical significance. This unresolved trauma is now compounded by the various stressors associated with COVID-19 outbreaks. Given the current outbreaks, with understandable concern about cross-infection risk in health facilities, many people with mental health needs would further delay seeking professional care. As such, Hong Kong College of Psychiatrists, the official professional organization representing all psychiatrists in Hong Kong, expanded their Care for All program to benefit people with mental health needs associated with COVID-19 since January 2020. This Care for All program consists of systematic, multi-pronged and multi-level mental health interventions intended originally to provide mental health education and free mental health interventions ranging from evidence-based CBT therapies to pharmacotherapy for people adversely affected by social unrest in Hong Kong. With expansion of the target groups to COVID-19 uh, groups, the Care for All program has produced mental health tips for the general public and for healthcare professionals. We are currently also launching an online survey of accessing the mental health of people with different vulnerabilities. As of today, over 100 patients have obtained a free psychiatric and related professional services from this program. Now, Hong Kong has only reported like zero to four imported cases every day in the past two weeks. So what are we doing next as psychiatrists? While Hong Kong College of Psychiatrists will step up its efforts to promote the Care for All program more to the general public and vulnerable groups, the college will continue to explore working with other non-government organizations in Hong Kong so as to provide multidisciplinary professional care to patients who cannot or prefer not to accept public mental health services. In response to an unanticipated mental health tsunami as evidenced by past post-SARS experience and recent research data, the public mental health services would also explore additional ways of supporting people with mental health distress associated with these two major traumas in Hong Kong. One possible strategy is to identify additional psychiatric comorbidities and worsening of mental health problems in patients already receiving public mental health services. Evidence has suggested that people with existing mental health problems are more likely to experience post-traumatic stress disorders than those without. In addition, fast-track clinics may be established in different regions to identify people adversely affected by these two traumatic events. And the assessment will be followed by timely and evidence-based psychological and pharmacological interventions according to the complexity of mental health needs. COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented infectious outbreak that affects everyone in many ways. The mental health consequences of the pandemic is likely to last for a much longer period of time after the pandemic has been under control. As mental health professionals, 
We need to take a leading role to lobby the government to invest in public mental health in order to enhance public mental health resilience, prevent and control the damage of mental health tsunami following the earthquake caused by the current pandemic. Many thanks for your attention and interest in this webinar. Thank you. Uh, so we're really grateful to um, Roger for sharing that with us. Uh, as I said before, he's in Hong Kong and there's a time difference, um, so he couldn't actually be with us, but he is willing to take questions. So for the things that you would like to ask him, uh, type them in the box and we'll get them to, to him and, um, and get them um, back to you. Very interesting to hear what he was saying about masks, because there's been a lot of controversy here about whether we should be wearing masks or not. Um, in Hong Kong, um, they do. So our next speaker is an old friend of mine who I worked with in Leeds for, for many years, um, Dr. Manoj Kumar. He is the founder and clinical director of the Mental Health Action Trust in Kerala in um, India. This trust has been providing free comprehensive community psychiatric services, including community-based rehabilitation and psychosocial interventions for the last decade to cover 4,000 people. It's an exclusive service for economically backward people with severe mental and volunteers. So over to you, Marsh. Thank you, Wendy. Delighted to be here, delighted to see you, and uh, delighted to be part of uh, this uh, series of uh, webinars. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, about how um, in Kerala, we have coped uh, with the impact of the pandemic uh, on the community mental health services that we offer. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Yes. So just to provide the context for this, uh, in India, um, we have been really made aware of uh, the uh, issues associated with COVID only for the last couple of months. But in Kerala, uh, we had the first case from Wuhan uh, towards the end of January itself. Now, as you all probably know, we are a very thickly populated country, 1.38 billion people, and it's the seventh uh, largest country in the world. Uh, now, if you look at the map of India, Kerala is on the southwest corner. A tiny piece of um, uh, land in the southwest corner is Kerala. We are a small state. Uh, we are only the 23rd out of the 29 states, but we are thickly populated. So we have a population of 36 million. So to put it into context, um, slightly over half the population of uh, UK. Uh, so, so far, the impact of uh, COVID has been, um, shall, I, shall I say, less than what we had feared. Um, we have had around 80,000 COVID-19 positive people and around 200, 2,500 deaths for this large population in India. And uh, even though the uh, epidemic started in Kerala, we have been fairly uh, successful in flattening the curve. We have had uh, around 535 uh, positive patients and only four deaths so far. And uh, from the middle of um, uh, April, um, we have been, sorry, middle of, uh, towards the end of March onwards, we have been under lockdown. So um, all in all, it has been uh, nearly seven to eight weeks of lockdown here. Now, there's a lot of controversy about the effects of lockdown and, uh, you know, as the previous speaker mentioned about individual autonomy. But um, in general, it has been quite enthusiastically uh, followed by the people. Uh, and is uh, uh, and the flattening of the curve is attributed to the effective uh, measures of lockdown as well as the efficient public health system in in Kerala. Can I have the next slide, please? So, what we do in MHAT, uh, which is the organization that I run, it's a charitable trust. So we work in the voluntary sector, and the model that we have employed for a number of years now is that. Uh, it's an entirely community-based mental health care model, and we use existing healthcare uh, infrastructure 
it may be of uh, uh, run by the local self government or it may be by local other local ngos uh, whereby a small team of us uh, comprising both of professionals as well as uh, mental health volunteers lay mental health workers in the community uh, work together closely to, pr to provide good quality mental health care to a large number of patients. Next, please. Can I have the next slide? Yes. So we have been doing this for more than uh, 11 years. Um, we have clinics across eight districts of Kerala. We have 50 such clinics. It's entirely community-based, so we have no inpatient care, so no facilities to give electroconvulsive therapy and so on. Um, and uh, we look after, we have looked after more than four and a half thousand uh, people. And this we do in close collaboration with local partners. So that's the crux of the model. We work with similarly minded uh, local groups in various parts of the state. Uh, so each group is uh, autonomous, look after their own finances um, and work closely with us in providing uh, as comprehensive as care as possible, which means not only good psychiatric care, good medical care, um, rehabilitation, day care, uh, um, family groups, peer support groups, and so on. And we have robust uh, in, uh, practices so that the quality is as good as possible. And till the COVID-19 epidemic, we used to run weekly clinics. So when the lockdown was announced, Initially, we weren't quite sure how to go about it, but we took the decision to stop. Obviously, we couldn't travel, so the weekly clinics had to go. Next slide, please. And we found out that the uh, transition uh, from uh, being on the ground, working with our partners in the community, a transition from that to an entirely remote way of working, to our pleasant uh, surprise seem, seem to go along seem to go very well and these are the four key elements which has helped us make that transition very smoothly we were already using technology significantly in our work we have a very robust uh, database uh, which has the capacity to produce an electronic prescription so even before the covid uh, stuck uh, we were into using an electronic database and the psychiatrists, we have all, always worked with one or two psychiatrists. Uh, we have stayed remote most of the time with occasional visits to the clinic. And other clinicians, mainly psychologists and social workers, clinical psychologists and psychiatric social workers, uh, have been at the forefront uh, working with mental health workers and volunteers and with our partners in the community. Uh, so we were well prepared technologically to make this transition. And the model of task sharing, whereby people with uh, lesser experience, lesser professional qualifications, were trained to act up, uh, has also helped in making this transition smooth. Now, the volunteers, more than 1,000 of them across the 50 centers, are all grassroots level workers who know the locality well and the clients very well. So for them also to switch to delivering medications at home, for example, um, preventing people from coming to the clinics, but providing uh, service at home uh, in a decentralized fashion seemed to work very well. Next slide, please. So we took a calculated decision that we were going to continue to sustain our services rather than getting into new activities. Because initially there was confusion whether we should get into uh, population level work, provide counseling helplines and so on. But when we looked at the literature, uh, we weren't very convinced that the immediate uh, psychological or psychiatric effects of uh, the epidemic warranted the services of a specialist team like ours. So we, we decided that the, uh, the counseling helplines and all could be done equally well or even better by people uh, who are uh, not necessarily mental health professionals. So we focused our entire efforts um, on um, maintaining our services and the biggest surprise for us was that after the first two or three weeks uh, from direct contact with the clients as well as feedbacks from our partners it feels it felt and it feels as if actually the quality of services has improved so we have come to learn that in-person contact may not be really that crucial because if we look at it 
we are now living in an era where we where we continue to maintain close relationships friendships through social media and so on so the last frontier which is uh, you know uh, with our clients uh, has also been uh, breached now and clients are really comfortable and these are extremely poor people in rural areas and semi rural areas uh, they seem to be extremely comfortable and they report that they are feeling actually better mainly because the role of the volunteers have increased uh, because during these difficult times the volunteers have uh, put in more effort than before to ensure that there are no uh, relapses really and uh, again as i said the literature uh, on these aspects is not very clear i'm not quite sure if we can uh, equate the current situation with that of disasters because i think it's quite different uh, we have had two disasters in the last couple of years with massive floods uh, we haven't really experienced a huge um, increase in psych psychiatric morbidity after the floods have receded there has been no demand from the ground for anything other than maintaining uh, our services uh, and therefore we have found that successfully keeping our services going uh, is is important because often in the clamor for uh, uh, psychological services to uh, counteract the aftermath of the epidemic uh, this is often lost sight of so uh, in future the epidemic uh, might have its effects on uh, an increase in psychiatric morbidity i'm not ex entirely convinced based on our flood experiences but this paradigm shift has really worked well and i think overall we in psychiatry should consider uh, the lessons from this uh, for us what has really worked is that the local resources uh, has strengthened uh, and that has really helped the distance from the actual service providers which is us does not seem to be mat does not seem to matter it is more the human contact either through either directly or through other uh, ways which seem to really matter that is not to say that some subgroups of clients may not suffer they may suffer especially people with learning disability people going to um, uh, daycare centers people who did, who uh, are otherwise uh, denied social contacts they may suffer but by and large most people have remained stable and as i said outcomes may even be better there seems to be less relapses uh, people who were uh, smokers and uh, uh, dependent on alcohol seem to have uh, managed the transmission surprisingly well uh, giving up smoking and alcohol has been very easy because neither have been available during the last seven weeks and often we find that the anxiety is not really about covid but other aspects uh, such as scares rumors uh, about uh, strangers on the prowl uh, so called black men uh, ha have all been uh, creating more anxieties than the actual covid uh, epidemic and the last slide please so in these difficult times uh, unusual solutions uh, need to be employed and we have done that and found that actually it might be uh, an opportunity to change it might be an opportunity to uh, bring in much more of uh, uh, remote contact which can be much more efficiently managed uh, i'm reminded of the last two times when i came to the uk to do locums and the extremely long waits to see a consultant psychiatrist and even at that time i was wondering could we not do something to cut these waiting lists uh, down and i think this is an ideal opportunity in most settings where there are uh, there is a struggle, there is a uh, crunch on resources and increase in technology does not necessarily mean less human contact so i think this is a time to change and while the economy may take a long time to discover i think in uh, psychiatry and psychological services uh, maybe it is an indicator that we can change our practices without losing much uh, last slide and thank you very much i hope you can um, hear me now uh, so thank you very much that was really interesting really positive um, and some things I wasn't expecting. I don't think the same has been true about alcohol here, perhaps because it has been um, available, but I'm hearing about more um, alcohol problems here. 
So our last speaker, and you will get a chance to ask some, some questions about the, the talk we just heard at the end. Um, our last speaker is Professor Petrus de Vries from, um, he's a professor of child and adolescent psychiatry uh, from South Africa. He's the um, director of the Centre for Autism Research in Africa and the Adolescent Health Research Unit at the University of Cape Town. He's a fellow um, of our college and he's chair of our African division. So thank you, Petrus. Thank you very much, Wendy, and thank you to the Royal College team for this opportunity. Um, thank you particularly to Isabel, who's going to have to manage all my slides in the background now. So, Isabel, we can go to the next slide. And I'll start by just saying greetings to everyone from beautiful Cape Town. Um, I'm showing the picture not only to show you what Cape Town looks like, because even the, many of us who live here in the city haven't seen the mountain for the last 49 days, because we've been in lockdown. Um, for that long, and we've had quite a, a serious lockdown. Uh, next slide. But I also want to say greetings from my colleagues. So on the photograph, you can see Dr. Catherine Matisia, who's the Deputy Chair of the African Division, and on the other side, Dr. Abdul Jallo, who's the um, Financial Officer of the team. And particular thanks to them, because they've been very helpful at thinking with me about some of the challenges that we are facing in Africa. Um, I fear our story and my story might not be quite as positive as we've just heard from Manoj um, from India. Um, so next slide. Uh, COVID certainly has brought a whole new world and a change world to all of us. And so I had to think really carefully, how do we tell a bit of a story about Africa without just giving you some sad and difficult news. So next slide. What I decided to do was just to give a, a number of general observations about COVID first, certainly through African eyes, and then just to tell you a little bit about um, psychiatry and mental health in Africa and the impact of COVID on um, these services. Given that it's likely not to be all good news, I thought I should try and end with some actions and some positives of things that we've been trying to do and that are and have been emerging as well. So next slide. So five specific observations. You can see I'm used to teaching. I'm not used to these kind of webinar sort of things. Next slide. And my first observation is just that COVID is really everywhere. And at first people weren't sure but it's in every region and in all countries of hugely variable severity, mainly in adults and older people, although you would all have read about these possible unusual cases, Kawasaki type um, presentation in children. Um, and there's been lots of confusion about the language used around COVID symptoms versus confirmed, screening versus tested, etc. And huge uncertainty has emerged. And I think a lot of the mental health consequences that we've seen has been around what I might call the psychology of uncertainty. Next slide. Here you can see you've all been looking at the, I'm sure, the Johns Hopkins website. These are yesterday's numbers, just over 4 million people worldwide, positive and just under 300,000 deaths. And you can see the, the, the clusters are more in the Northern Hemisphere, but even Africa is now involved. And in fact, in the last week, Lesotho was the last country in Africa that had their first positive case. So every country on our continent now also has positive cases. Next slide. But I think it's useful also just to reflect that in Africa, we're also used to many other communicable diseases that have a very different kind of magnitude, actually. So if we just look at HIV AIDS, 25 million people in Africa are HIV positive, and we have over a million deaths from HIV per year on the continent. Tuberculosis, two and a half million Africans and about half a million deaths per year. Malaria, over 200 million Africans in 2017, with also just over 400,000 deaths per year. So you can see that when we have COVID in Africa, it's really in a very different context in comparison to many other countries and parts of the world. Next slide. You've all seen it, and I think a really prominent observation has been fake news and the whole infodemic. Fake news about causes and treatments and the high volume of information that we've all been overloaded with and the changing information um, that's been happening. Uh, next slide shows 
um, one of, I'm sure you've all seen and enjoyed suggestions about disinfectants as possible treatments. Um, and if we look at the next slide, that was really just to remind me that in Africa, we've had similar problems around fake news and many significant concerns. You've seen in the bottom on the picture there, the president of Madagascar promoting a, a local tonic that came that comes from Madagascar. Um, we've heard leaders of other countries promoting that alcohol might disinfect the throat and therefore prevent um, COVID-19. And we've had all sorts of terrible things. And that's really made it very hard for responses, both from medical staff and from governments, to try and promote appropriate actions and activities um, of people. I mean, particular concern, for instance, is that there were many people in Africa who believed that receiving a test for coronavirus might in fact infect them. So you can see how people that might lead people to avoiding seeking assessment and, and possible testing. Next slide. It's very striking in Africa, maybe everywhere, but I'm focusing on our continent. The, the responses in our countries have been hugely variable in screening, in testing, in their lockdown strategies. And of course, th those are attributable to the variable information systems that we have, variable expertise that different countries have, have, and the very variable health systems and strengths and weaknesses in our health systems. If nothing else, COVID has really put the spotlight on the challenges and the weaknesses and the gaps in our African healthcare systems. Next slide, which is kind of an illustrative slide in a way, just to give you a few examples. Um, and apologies if you can't see all the numbers there, I'll try to um, remember them. So if we start with South Africa at the bottom, we have a population of just about 57 million people, and we have just over 11,000 cases positive at the moment. And you can see the graph is clearly going up. It's worth pointing out that in South Africa, we've done about 360,000 tests to date. So 360, just to put that in perspective, the UK goal, I won't go into the politics of UK targets, but about 100,000 tests per day. So what we've done in total in South Africa is about three or four days worth of testing in the UK. Germany apparently has a capacity of about 800,000 tests per day. So that's just worth keeping in mind. If we go up the East Coast, Tanzania is a larger population, 59 million. They've only reported 509 cases to date. And if you can look at that little graph, it's very patchy. And what we hear is that the Tanzanian government do not want to release data. And they've actually also done very limited testing in the country. On the other side, on the, on the West Coast, Nigeria, the largest country in that region, 200 million people and only 4,700 have been diagnosed positive. And we really don't know to what extent screening is done, testing is done, and how people are actually implementing appropriate safety um, strategies in, in that country. Next slide. Like everywhere in the world, technology for everyone has emerged to connect to one another, to connect to information, to trace contacts for education, etc. But what it's really done in Africa is to highlight the digital divide. And if we look at the next slide, I can use that to illustrate what I mean by the digital divide. Here's a map of internet users as a proportion of country population. And if you look at the UK, Scandinavian countries, Canada, etc., most homes, 90 plus percent of homes in the UK have internet. In Africa, the average is actually somewhere around 10%. So there are significant challenges if we say, let's do things online, let's stream classes, let's assess people and access people through technology. And it's really been highlighted through our efforts to try and move towards technology um, during these times. Next slide. And my last general comment has really just been about the burden on families. Ultimately, we live on our own in our families with coronavirus. And so the burden in terms of self-care, in terms of child care, the economic impact, the emotional impact on families has been incredible. My next slide, if you look at it, was just a little drawing just to show how people try to navigate work and looking after children and cleaning and the information and all those challenges. And we're really at a point in Africa where the question is being asked, 
whether the consequences and the impact of the lockdown, how that relates to the consequences and the impact of the COVID-19 itself. Next slide, in fact, Vikram Patel from India has um, in this week published a very interesting perspective piece in The Lancet, where he asked the question about, have we forgotten about the principles of global health? And what he meant was one of the key principles of global health is identifying the context and the contextual needs for whatever the, inter the, the illness, the disease or the pathology might be. To put it another way, if we look at my next picture on the next slide, is really just to say we have a concern and we're looking for interventions, but that intervention really needs to be suitable for the soil, for the context that we're in. And so it really beggars the question to what extent we have reached the right kind of interventions to manage COVID-19 in African context and in African soil. So let me tell you a little bit about what's happening here. Next slide. In terms of clinical services in Africa, there's been a rapid de-escalation of clinical care. Only emergencies are seen in most places. Telephone consultations where possible. There's significant challenges in accessing medication. So patients struggling to access medication, but also countries who are dependent on imports struggling to get imports from countries that are now withholding medications because of concern. Um, there's clearly reduced support to and from the non-profit sector um, and we see huge amounts of financial distress and food poverty. In fact, I work at a tertiary clinic and what we do more than anything else is to hand out food parcels to the families who come to our clinics. Next slide. Teaching and training, of course, everyone's been driven to online teaching and training, but there are, I've already alluded to the limitations of technology. And of course, that we've also seen a reduction in the range of cases for training and the challenges therefore for our trainees to meet other kind of requirements. We've had significant delays in examinations. And of course, that leads to huge anxiety and uncertainty for trainees. And on the next slide, in terms of the impact on research, all clinical research had to stop. In essence, at my university, like many others, almost within a week. And so now any clinical research that's not a highly motivated clinical trial needs to be reconsidered. So there's been a huge deprioritization, particularly against clinical um, and now teaching activities starting to emerge again. And of course, we have to accept and think about the ethical implications. What really, are the kinds of research that we can and should do now while people are in lockdown, while families have all sorts of financial, economic and other emotional and psychosocial pressures. Next slide. Other concerning themes that have been emerging really um, have been, one, the belief that coming to the hospital will actually increase your chance of getting COVID-19. And for me, even more concerning, the evidence of stigmatization of healthcare workers as reservoir for COVID-19. So I've heard many stories um, from about healthcare workers who've been targeted because people see them as the, the source of the coronavirus. And of course, for many patients with mental health problems, families with um, family members with disabilities, etc., the inability to go out, the inability to exercise, to access care, work, food, etc., has really had an increasing impact on our families and our communities. Next slide. So my concerns, I think, for Africa are that the health and the economic disparities that we knew were there are being exacerbated as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the concern is that the health and economic consequences of lockdown might actually be worse than those of COVID-19 itself. And I'm worried that we may come to the point of looking back at the pandemic and that public health interpretations will be made about COVID-19 in Africa without really considering the significant barriers that we have to testing, to accessing screening, to accessing healthcare, etc. Next slide. 
that was just to remind myself that I'm going to say some positive things as well. So next slide. There has been some good things and we have to admit that. Rapid take up of remote learning, teaching, coaching. And what's been very nice is to see a real shift in motivation from families and from professionals to use technology for clinical purposes and for clinical care. And it's been incredibly um, rewarding to see the willingness of people to allow access to data and to devices and free courses and resources, etc. So that's been very, very encouraging. Next slide. Some of the things that we've tried to do is we decided, um, previous slide please, that rather than to create more information, we're going to curate information. So at the University of Cape Town and in collaboration with a number of organisations, we actually have pulled together WHO resources, other sensible, reliable and valid resources to make it somehow more accessible for many individuals. In the journal Autism Research, um, I'm co-editing a piece that we've proactively asked autism researchers to think and reflect on the implications of the epidemic and the, or the pandemic on our thinking about our research. And we've done some very basic things in collaboration with Yakupap, the Child Psychiatry International Society, the South African Society and others. We've prepared very basic, simple, fundamental principles about tips for parents to support their children during lockdown, including for parents of children with different disabilities and mental health problems. And of course, we've tried, and many of my colleagues have done and are doing advocacy with um, autism and other disability organizations to governments to provide additional supports um, and allowances during lockdown. Next slide. And this is the picture you've just seen. We've shown this was meant to be a face-to-face three-day conference in South Africa in June. And within a month, the team have been able to turn it into a full online conference. So I think sometimes good things come from these really, really challenging situations. Next slide. And this is my second last slide, really just to remind me and to remind all of us that the social relief of distress is so important. If families come to us and if patients come to us and they are hungry and they don't have food, we cannot treat their mental health problems. And I really hope that we can find a way, particularly in Africa where our curves are still on the way up rather than on the way down, that we can manage that balance between mental health and physical health care and social needs in our communities. And with that, on my next slide, I will say thank you to everyone. And I hope there'll be some chance for questions. Wendy, thank you. Thank you. That was another really fascinating um, talk. We haven't got long. We've got nine minutes and the questions um, are flooding in. Um, I'm going to start with Manoj, if we could go to him. Um, lots of lots of questions. Um, I've picked out two of them. One is, how can people mm -hmm. learn more about your service? Um, and the other one is, how do volunteers communicate with the doctors and nurses? Two <laughs> questions. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll take the second question first. Uh, uh, see, the uh, telephone services have, been, have always been very good for the last couple of two to three years. So apart from uh, video conferencing, the mainstay of our uh, contact are telephones. Uh, so the the actually the target uh, population uh, may not have direct access to telephones, but they will there will be at least somebody in the community with access to telephones. So the volunteers, either in person, despite the lockdown, because these are you know smaller uh, places, uh, so either directly or through telephone they contact uh, the clients and their families. Uh, to learn more about our work, uh, we have a website which is uh, www.mhat, M-H-A-T, Kerala, K-E-R-A-L-A, mhatkerala.org. Uh, you can contact me through uh, through the website and I'll be delighted to send you more information or uh, even talk to interested people uh, over WhatsApp or, or so. Thank you. Uh, and having heard quite a lot about the service myself, it is really worth, um, it's a brilliant, brilliant service and what a model of sustainability as well. And it is a charity and you can um, 
you can donate a small amount each month if you'd like to. Thank um, you. The next, question, <laughs> uh, the next question, if we go <laughs> to Petrus now, um, the next question is about PTSD. Do you think we're going to see a lot more PTSD um, after the pandemic? It's very difficult to say because we have such, and, and I won't try to answer it on a global level, in Africa we have such high levels of trauma anyway, so that you know whether we're going to see increases in PTSD as a result of COVID or whether we're going to see PTSD as a result of the implications of lockdown is an open question. I will give you one example. Um, only this morning we had a staff meeting in the university and we've heard a lot in the last 48 days about intimate partner violence and about gender-based violence because families are locked down, husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends. And that's, we have a baseline problem in terms of um, intimate partner violence, but this is really shot up. So again, we may see PTSD. I'm not sure that the narrative about the PTSD will necessarily will be about the coronavirus. Um, my, my hypothesis would be, it would be more about being locked down. And if we just imagine, I mean, I don't know if on our call, but some of us are very fortunate and we have houses and people have gardens and apartments and so on. But many, at least a third of people in my country and many people in Manush's country live in very high density areas. They live in shacks, they live in slums. There is no such a thing as doing social distancing. Um, people might live in a one room. Um, Dwelling. So, so the context, that's why I keep coming back also to context. So the, it's the contextual factors that might lead us and might push us towards PTSD related challenges rather than the virus itself. Thank you. And, and to pick up on um, another point, alcohol. So, Manoj, you said that alcohol, people are actually stopping alcohol, uh, whereas in the UK we're hearing about people um, drinking more. Um, and they actually said that all off licenses were essential shops that would be kept open. Um, and then we've had the occasional thing of people who have been um, shielding, not going out, haven't been able to get alcohol, and are then going off into acute withdrawal. So I'd say it's been quite bad here. What, what's happened in Africa? What's it been like there? Well, so in South Africa, we have one of the most draconian lockdowns. So we have no alcohol for sale and no tobacco products for sale and haven't had for the last 43 days or 49 days. So I actually am surprised that I haven't heard more from a, from a mental health point of view about withdrawal or, or those kinds of things. Um, and Manoj, I mean, you argue maybe it was easy enough for people there. I don't I don't work in the community, so I don't know what has really happened on the ground. What I have heard is that there's a very lucrative black market and that actually people are finding ways of getting access to alcohol. Just at a very personal level, I would be very keen if anybody wants to send me a bottle of gin so that I can have my gin and tonic. Um, so many of us are concerned about running out of our own little bit of alcohol supply that's exactly perhaps useful for our mental health and well-being. Um, but so it is a very interesting question, Wendy. I don't have a good answer for you, but that's certainly been the lockdown here. Of course, many people make home brew. So a lot of the mainstay drink in Africa is home brewed beer. And so maybe people have still been able to make some of those um, kinds of products at home. I'm not sure. So many interesting questions coming through. We can't get through them all. Um, there's one that's just caught my eye, which is about funerals. Um, so in the UK, attendance at funerals has been really restricted. Often people can't be with their loved ones when they die. That's being done over FaceTime. Um, and then attendance at funerals is being restricted, which may lead to all sorts of problems in the grieving process. Um, Manoj, I'll go to you first. And what's happening in India about funerals? Uh, I'm I'm sorry. I, I, there's a problem with the connection. I didn't catch the question. Oh, funerals. So in Hello. the UK, they're really restricting oh, yeah. how many people can attend funerals, oh, and we've got no yeah. kind of problem that's going to build up in yeah. terms of absolute grief. What's happening in Absolutely. India? That's the same thing. Um, uh, like Petra said, uh, the lockdown has been pretty uh, strongly uh, enforced. Uh, so that there are uh, stories of uh, uh, funerals, uh, people unable to attend funerals. 
or um, uh, you know just a few people managing to attend uh, most of the weddings have been called off there have been instances where the police have uh, arrested um, gatherings of people at funerals and uh, weddings or other celebrations including religious yeah. ones so the 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 um, enforcement has been fairly strict and uh, yeah all of these social uh, gatherings uh, uh, have been uh, quite badly affected the newspapers were full of advertisements of uh, marriages weddings postponed because as you know weddings are a yeah. big thing in india big celebration yeah. so yeah. Uh, you know people pick out small yeah. advertisements uh, you know announcing yeah. the postponement of weddings so yes all you're kinds the, of social yeah you're the country yeah. of weddings we we are the continent of funerals and i say that not <laughs> as a joke but because um in most of Africa, our cultural beliefs are to be respectful to ancestors mm -hmm. and to celebrate your elders when they die and become your ancestors. So it's actually, from a psychological point of view, an incredibly important part of the grieving process, exactly as you say, Wendy. So governments have been as sensitive as they could about that issue of funerals. So um, that's been one of the exceptions to people being allowed to travel, for instance. You can travel for a funeral. Um, they've, at first it was 100 people, then 50 people. I think at the moment it might be 10 people. It may change again. But, but you're absolutely right. That's such a fundamental part of our life journey. Um, and in our continent in particular, being able to celebrate and respect your, your passing um elders to become ancestors is is a really really fundamental component of our cultures okay um, i'm afraid we've run out of um time now there's still lots of questions we'll see if we can get some answers um from the speakers and answer some of the other questions sure. so um a massive thanks to all three of the speakers um thank you all the people that have joined and see you again soon bye-bye thank you bye. thank you thank you bye Thank you.